Okay, here we are, you and me, in our respective points in time space, brought together because you chose to just push play and listen. I'm grateful to you for that. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks Podcast. As you probably know, my name is Jay Brown. Welcome to you, especially if this is your first time here. But for everyone else, what's up? How's it going? How are we feeling? I'm happy to say that uh, things are a little bit better for me. You know, as you know, some of you have been listening. It's been a rocky time. And uh, I'm I'm knocking on some wood, but (laughs) everything was a little bit better this week, and I am immensely grateful for that. Of course, I mean, my own personal being, my own personal body's been a little bit out of commission. I think I mentioned I sprained my ankle really bad last week, and it wasn't like a kind of just, oh, stepped on it weird, but like, it's a long story I'm not going to tell, but I my body got moved in a way that it wasn't able to move, and there was a loud pop, and then my ankle swelled up real big, you know? And I would say it's about, I don't know, 75, 80% healed at this point. And I could have rested it more than I did, but it's it's healing up. It's it's going to be fine. I didn't break nothing. But it's just amazing when life does that to you and when it does that to you and the circumstances around that and the messages that one might get, you know? And the other thing I've really been thinking about is how much sometimes we we alter our patterns in order to aid our body in its like healing. Like I've had this like injury, so I had to change what I would normally do. And then it's interesting to see how as soon as it starts to feel a little bit better, I want to jump back in. You know, you want to jump right back into what I would have been doing if I didn't have this <laughs> sprained ankle. And it just, there's been like a minor, like yesterday, I was like a minor retweak. Like not bad, but just the universe was like, no, 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 not so fast, sir. <laughs> you know, like there's a communication and it has to do with some of what today's conversation is about, as a matter of fact, about what my guest today, Monica Voss, likes to call release. About sort of letting go and releasing so you don't have to make as much effort. (laughs) Well, we're going to talk about it today. And you'll hear, I tell Monica how she ended up being on the show, mainly because I really wanted to talk to somebody about Vonda Scaravelli. And if you're a yoga teacher who's listening to this, who doesn't know that name, I really think you should. I think this is some serious continuing education today. The name Vonda Scaravelli has come up a couple of times on the show, but we've never really had like a conversation specifically about her. I've never really had anybody, I think, who studied with her directly on the show before. Although there might've been one. I don't know if Peter... Blackaby did or not. I know he talked about Vonda, but I don't know if he studied with her. In any case, Monica did. And I also learned about her teacher, Esther Myers, who's another important name, I think. And if you're from Canada, you probably know these names more, maybe Canada and the UK. But in any case, I learned a lot. And I was very happy to have this opportunity to connect with Monica and really get to some, I think, important ideas about yoga practice, at least as it's serving me these days. So it was just great fun to connect with Monica, and I'm really glad to be able to share it with you today. Real quick before we get to that, I do want to express my gratitude to our podcast premium subscribers. Specifically today, I want to say thanks to Teresa O'Malley, and Mandy Huff, especially Teresa and Mandy. Big shout outs to you, longtime supporters of this show. And if you're someone who's newer and you've been listening and you appreciate what you've been listening to, 
and you want to get access to the full archives or just want to show your support, the way that you would do that is through a podcast premium subscription. It's choose your rate, cancel at any time. If you want to get to old episodes and you don't have any money, all you do is you email us and we send you a free account, no questions asked. But if you have even just a little bit of something to give, this is the way that independent media sources like this are able to survive because people give a few dollars each month to support it. So we're incredibly grateful to everybody who does that. If you want to learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber or all the other stuff that I do, I've got ongoing weekly live stream classes. And if you want to be involved in discussions with other yoga teachers about the topics that I talk about here on the show, then you can also join in on the weekly teacher's call. All of my stuff, everything can be found at jbrownyoga.com. All right, y'all. Let's see. Is there anything else? No, I don't think there's anything else that we need to talk about now. We will touch base on the other side, but I think that's good. So let's go ahead and listen to this conversation that I had with Monica Voss. There we go. <laughs> okay. Did you resolve the sound? Is everything sounding okay to you? Do you Yeah. What about uh, to you? Everything sounds good to me. So Great. I'm good on my side if you're good on your yeah. side. It's the first time I've ever used um, earphones, so I okay. beg your indulgence. Yeah. Okay. Great. No, no, thank Thanks. you. I think it sounds good. And um, I'm already recording. And if it's okay, I'd like to consider us having already begun, if that's all right with you. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I'm glad to get this chance to speak with you. I I know it took a little bit for us to sync up. I'm glad we managed to do it. Um, I really appreciate you giving me this time and and talking to me today. Thank you. I'm very happy to do it. I've heard about you so much over the years, so it's, it's lovely to actually meet you. Oh, I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that. Well, I mentioned to you in an email while you're, why you're here, but let me, clue everybody else and who might listen to this at another time. You know, I have this weekly teacher's call that I do where a gathering of teachers come together in a Zoom meeting like this. And we often go off of like what's been talking, we were talking about on the podcast this week, or sometimes it's just whatever's coming up for us. Mm -hmm. And it's become very co-creative over the years. And recently we were in one of these meetings and the name Vonda Scaravelli came up and I've, I've heard the name before. It's been said some on the show before. I remember Peter Blackaby mentioning Vonda. I personally know of that name because I'm greatly inspired by the TKV Desikachar teachings and she was a student of his, but I couldn't remember having ever really spoken to anybody who might've actually studied with her firsthand. And I still haven't ever really had a conversation about what she was teaching, like what the practice she was doing, because it seemed like she had some very specific, some things that she was adding or some things that she was bringing. Yeah. Um, and so I mentioned that in this teacher's group. And I said, does anybody know anybody? And sure enough, my friend Alma, shout out to her. She's always great for some good podcast guests. She said, oh, I know somebody, Monica Voss, you got to look her up in Canada. So... Oh. That's what brought us together is somebody knew that you had a history with Vonda. And when I was getting ready to talk with you, though, I also learned of Esther Myers, which was a name I had not heard of before. Yeah. So maybe to get us started, because I know that you got to Vonda through Esther. Maybe we start with Esther. And sure. I'm wondering, I know I read somewhere that you started studying with her in 1978. I was six years old at the time. I just turned 50. So I feel like I'm <laughs> getting somewhere with the age. But I ask yeah. that only in that it's, I'm curious what the yoga scene was like in Canada in 1978. How mm-hmm. did you end up going to a yoga class and how did it end up being Esther? Um, 
At that time, I wasn't interested in yoga because I was in my, I guess I was in my late 20s, and um, and I thought yoga was all about gaining flexibility, and I didn't think that's what I needed. What I, what I thought I needed or felt I needed was some, some sort of structure, some sort of physical structure. Um, and um, uh, dance, dancing wasn't quite giving it, to me in the, in the way I was looking for. Um, so a friend of mine was, um, but yoga, I didn't think yoga was, was going to be the answer either. Um, and I wasn't really looking for an answer. I was just looking. I was just in, in sort of a, a kind of a, a limbo. Um, and, um, actually it was a girlfriend of mine who, who, who insisted I come along to her yoga class, which was taught by, Esther. So I didn't know anything about yoga. I didn't think I would be interested. Um, it took me about a year and a half to, to actually show up in class. And um, and I loved it from the first second pretty well. And um, forgive me for interrupting, was that at a yoga center? Because I'm curious, like I know there wasn't a lot of yoga, a yoga center on every corner in 1978. I know that for a fact. Right. So I'm curious right. about where that class was. Was there a center at that time? There was. Um, there were two centers actually, and Esther taught uh, part time at one of them, and she also taught um, on her own. She found you know, she found a she was teaching in somebody's living room as as mm-hmm. it, as it, as as it, it was, was customary for the time. By customary, um, and still is much of in much of the uh, many of my friends in England still teach in their homes and, and anyway mm-hmm. um, here too um, but um, so Esther was um, a Canadian she was a Torontonian who moved to England um, after university just really not knowing what what else to do um, she was very interested in R.D. Lang and got a job basically as a receptionist in one of his homes um, one of his houses, and um, and apparently um, the the fact the the the, um, the staff had meetings sitting on the floor, and she couldn't sit on the floor very well. And then she learned that everybody was 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 studying yoga, so she thought, oh, maybe that'll help her sit on the ground to be comfortable for these meetings. And that's what um, and that's where she began her yoga practice, and and it was. Um, the Iyengar method in, in those days, which is uh, which was very big in in England and actually still is, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so then she decided to to become a teacher, and um, this is sort of a long story, but anyway, I'll try to I'll try to be brief. Um, well, I mean, and- becoming a teacher in the Iyengar method in the late seventies, I mean, was a different process than it people know today. Exactly. So what you needed was the the okay of three um, sort of accredited teachers at the time. So you went from one to the other, and if they gave you their approval, then you went to someone else. And her uh, Esther's three teachers were Diana Clifton, who is um, not sure if if she's still alive. I never met her. Mary Stewart, who um, who I'm very close friends with. And Angela Farmer. So those were her three um, teachers, wow. and, she, and she got her. And anyway, she, so she she got her. She they they said what, five. Was was the approval based on your execution of the asana? Um, mostly, and um, and your uh, good question. Um, her uh, your ones. Um, uh, mm, yeah, facility in the, in the, in the postures and, and, and there must have been some sort of teaching element or, or assisting. There must have been some sort of assisting, but I, I don't know exactly what form it took. It took. Interesting. Well, I've had Angela on before. I'll have to get her back on and I'll, I'll make a note to ask her that question. Right. Right. <laughs> She'll know. Right. She was there. <laughs> Um, so then Esther came back to Toronto and, and, and began to teach. And, and you're absolutely right. There was one, there were two yoga schools in, um, in Toronto and Toronto is quite a big city, um, at that time. 
and um, and Esther opened hers in 1979, so that made three. Yeah. So so my going to Esther was was just as much a coincidence as um, as meeting almost as much of a coincidence as meeting Vanda. Yeah. But when you met Esther, was she teaching Iyengar method? Absolutely, and she was the only. She was the first person in in um, um, Canada to teach the Iyengar method in a consistent way, um, ex- except uh, except for another woman called Maureen Carruthers who was teaching in Vancouver, and that's a very far <laughs> that's a very very far away. So just the two of them at that time, mm-hmm. and so you know she was. Esther was a curiosity. She drew um, students like me who just sort of, you know, wandered in. Um, but she also was, you know, um, quite attractive to teachers because she was so different hmm. from what they and, what been touching. You know. And what was it that grabbed you? I mean, you you're still doing it now, all these years later. So something about that practice with Esther, because I know there's those first experiences. What was it that grabbed you? Uh, well, first of all, I'm not still doing it, it now. It was okay. the it was the Iyengar method back then, and, and I know the, I meant yoga in general. But oh, yoga in general. Yeah. Well, I mean that's that's an interesting question too, because um, in fact, well, what grabbed me was the structure, and that's. I think I think that's that's what I was looking for without really realizing it, mm-hmm. and then within that structure, uh, as the years went on, I was looking for a sense of freedom within the structure, but did, actually didn't find it. They so, always talk about they always would talk about freedom in the structure, but it it didn't always happen in the classes, huh? <laughs> well, it didn't happen at all for me, yeah, other, yeah. Than, other yeah. than in my mind and. Um, so, so, so something was missing, and I couldn't really articulate what it was um, until I met Vanda, and then, um, and then that became clear. And yeah. did that happen for Esther too? Do you think? Did Esther at some point uh, veer away from Iyengar towards what Vanda was doing as well? Is that is that how you got there? Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. So. So Vanda, even though she learned from Iyengar, actually taught in a way that was, um, I would say, opposite, opposite, completely opposite in, teg- in, in terms of integrity and, and approach. Yeah, yeah, complete, complete opposite. Yeah, I, I, from what I've heard, it, and we've talked about this in this teacher's group of mine all the time, that like the Iyengar method felt very like outside in. Like you said, there's something great about having a structure to hang on to, you know, but it's an outside kind of imposition on the system almost, as opposed yeah. to some kind of inside first, and then that's coming out something like that. So it is kind of an inverse in a way. I think I understand what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so Vanda used the... Uh, Use the postures, which she learned from Iyengar, but um, as, as you say, she changed the she changed the approach to the postures. She didn't give up on the postures. <laughs> um, Do you remember uh, when, like Esther? What, did Esther find Vanda first, and then um, like? Do you remember when that happened? When that first started oh, to shift? Yeah, very much. <laughs> So Esther was a student of Donna Holloman, and um, and so was Mary Stewart, as a matter of fact. And Donna moved to from London to um, to Florence. So um, Esther and they didn't go together, but they happened to be there at the same time. Sometimes Mary and, and Esther, and on one of those um, trips to study with Donna, Donna introduced um, her to Vanda. And Esther said initially it was a it was a basically a non event except that um Vanda said, Well you must you must look up my um son in law in Toronto and study and practice yoga with him because he's he's um he's into yoga and so that was uh, sort of the 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 I don't know what to call it, sort of the hook. Um, and so Esther did, you know, so a year went by and she was 
practicing um, with uh, with Vanda's son-in-law and, and her and her daughter. So her her daughter and son-in-law live in Toronto. Not only do they live in Toronto, but they live you know three blocks away um, from okay. where I lived <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and where and where Esther's studio was and where Esther lived herself. So it was just a incredible. Anyway, so a year went by and and then. Um, um, a teacher, um, an Italian teacher, called Esther to say, "Oh, hello, I'm I'm here in Toronto, you know, just to just to say hello." And and by the way, Vanda's here too. Why don't you give her a call? And and what happened? What happens with Vanda when you gave her a call is that she would say, "Well, then you must come for a lesson." So um, <laughs> so then Esther Esther began um, with Vanda, and and then. You know, and then it, and then it began to affect her. And, um, so that was 1984, 1985. I, I, I began in 1986 here in Toronto. So Vanda spent five months a year in Toronto. Yeah. And, and, and she had no, yeah, she had no social obligations. So she was free and she wanted to teach. She did a lot of teaching here. Yeah. And was her teaching you, I think you just said this with Esther. Was that one to one teaching, or, or did she also do groups? I'm just curious because I know, like in Desika Char tradition, it was always one to one teaching. Had a lot yeah. to do with the relationship between the teacher and student, rather than yeah. kind of like these group drop in classes. And yeah. I'm curious if Vonda was teaching group classes, or was it all one to one? Only one to one. Yeah, mm. yeah, only one to one. Yeah, interesting. So Esther had three lessons a week for all of those months, and I had two. And there were others. I mean, there there were um, we weren't the only two. There were a few other teachers that um, that Vanda taught here in Toronto. But um, yeah, so it was uh, it was an amazing. Good. All right. Fortune. Did you did you get to have one to one practice with Vanda? Twice a week. Yeah. Wow. All right. So. All right. Well, first of all, I guess, what was that like? What was the, you said it was like the, the opposite of like mm-hmm. what you were originally doing with mm-hmm. the Iyengar method with Esther. Right. So yeah. how did how, she how did flip that, it for you? Like what was the process? Yeah. Like, did you say something about what those lessons were like, those first lessons with Vonda? Definitely. Um, uh, the, um, without... It was very, very interesting from a teaching point of view. So Vanda taught the postures that I'm assuming she learned from my Angar in the order that she learned them. So on the one hand, her lessons were were very were very structured. It was always, you know, you began with um, either standing poses or inversions, and then back bends, and then sitting postures, and then some. Um, pranayama and it was always that way mm. so so from an external point of view um, in her teaching was almost as let's say rigid as an Iyengar class but within that somehow she was able to um, communicate uh, license, license to explore, and she um, and she wasn't interested in the explorations. She it was like her job was to teach the postures and to teach the concepts underlying the postures. And there were three of those. One was grounding, which is which I, I think she you know she she experienced, but she also learned from Tai Chi. Um, breathing, which is which is part of every yoga practice, and the, um, the elongation of the spine, which really is is new. It's fresh. It's not it's not part of any other yoga tradition that I've ever experienced in the way she taught it. So so there was a conceptual base to her teaching. So that was structure. There were the postures that was structure, but within all that, um, there there was tremendous freedom. And it was so interesting because she didn't she didn't seem to care what it was you discovered. That was your that was your business. And she'd say things like, 
this is what I learned, and this is where I took what I learned. Now it's up to you. You can do whatever you want with this. In fact, the last time I saw her, which was in 1998, um, she said... Um, Try it this way. Try it this way. Well, I had already been trying it for 50 years. 15 years. Try it this way, she said. Try it. And if you don't like it, change it. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like some Jessica Char influence to me in terms of its needing to be personal to you and personal practice and one-to-one -one instruction, that signature and breath orientation too. I guess... Before we talk about elongation of the spine, because I have some questions about that one, I'm curious about how you just said that Vonda still had like a lot of structure. That's very interesting to me because a lot of the more somatic kind of exploratory practice that people are doing these days that are being brought into yoga practices quite a bit is specifically around form in a way, like, and letting go, like, letting the forms be more improvisatory in a sense, like Angela Farmer and Victor these days, they don't, they're just like, imagine you have a tail, you know what I mean? Like they're going into the shoulder. They're not teaching structured practice in the same way that you're describing Vonda was. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the key to having that structure, but still allowing for that agency that you mentioned had to do with like the relationship to the forms like was she teaching strict alignment or like doesn't there need to be how do you have agency if if the emphasis is all on getting your knee exactly to this place over your ankle or whatever it was mm -hmm. yeah yeah well um what i what i realized was the um, the rules drop away in fact the only the only rule has to do with safety so um so there were so there were points of precision um elbows you know grounding the elbows in headstand for example um or you know making sure you don't torque your knee that would be another that would be another rule but other than that uh no mm. no yeah no rules um, this the, the, the four, I think she liked the forms or maybe they reminded her of her teacher, but, but just as an aside, um, I have had these conversations before about, uh, Vanda's influences and, um, and people, people seem to enjoy to continue and I do it myself, I must admit, to reference her, um, her teachers and perhaps not in general give her enough um credit for her for her own discoveries i wouldn't say inventions but discoveries um so in fact she learned from Jessica Char for a very short period of time and um and and also her experience with anger was not that uh was not that was not a huge duration she was she was left on her own devices and i think this is um, you know, the, the, the lesson that, that, that we can take from, uh, from her. I appreciate her that. I didn't life. mean to take away from oh. her own, uh, contributions. No. In fact, that's what I mean when the elongation of the spine, like her ideas around that seem very unique to me that I was going to get yeah. there. My, my intention there was, as you said, she said, this is what I learned do with it as you will. So I'm kind of curious of what she learned, where she learned it from kind of thing. Right. Okay. But I appreciate what you're saying, especially in terms of, frankly, like women teachers, they, they more than men teachers. Like I remember at some point I had made this chart of teachers, the, like, a, like a history philosophy flow chart of who taught who and kind of charted it out. And someone kind of called me out. I was like, well, where's Indra Devi? Where's Vonda Scaravelli? I was like, you're absolutely right. You know, like they, they do don't always get the same yeah. something. So I appreciate you making that point. I think it's important. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, as I was saying, my curiosity around how she was able to, like you said, the rules went away. So a lot of a younger method, there were a kind of a lot of alignment sort of rules, it seemed to me. Yeah. And so when you let go of those rules, the focus then becomes what you said, those three things, like it was like this very simple formula. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you say ground yourself, is that kind of like this, I don't know, Pratyahara, like bringing the senses inwards or what, what would you describe the grounding yourself process as? Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's literal. It's literal. It's, um, this body on this ground and this ground where I'm sitting, I'm assuming where you're sitting is not the actual earth, but the earth is below and to, and to connect to the actual earth through, through the mind, through the body is what, is what she meant. It was very, very literal. It was physics. Yeah. And, um, and the amount of intention, um, that you, you know, garner or whatever, come up with to go down, that same amount brings us up because the gravity pulls in two directions, down and up. Um, and so that's, that's what she was on about the, the literally, Earthing, grounding, meaning going with the very positive pull of gravity, going with that, not endeavoring to pull up against it or or tighten yourself, or as my mother used to say, hold yourself up and hold yourself together, <laughs> get yourself together. <laughs> you know, it wasn't it wasn't yeah. that at all. It was release into the the actual natural law, you know, that supports us all, and so the. Um, the the key is release, 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 and then the energy comes back, and then you can basically do whatever you want with that energy, which is another way of saying what she said, um, which is try this, and if you like it, great, and if you don't, change it so that pouring, pouring in, pouring down to the ground, or for her, it might be, you know, dedicating yourself to this particular approach, and then find out what happens, and release is, uh, is the key to finding out about ourselves, or what we want, or what we want to do, or, um, or what we can do, I guess. Wow, well, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I always have this practice at the beginning of bringing attention to the feeling of the contact between your feet and the floor and it kind of seeing if you can feel into the pull of the earth holding you yeah. here. And yeah. then I always say that then there's you choosing to be upright, which is this upward direction, you know? That's, and so that no. grounding seems, does seem kind of essential. And there is kind of, I like the way that you said there's an energy to that or something that yeah. can be received. Mm -hmm. mm. giving giving and re and receiving and and well then that's that's fonda that's right the there. same principle you see there's these <laughs> yeah. principles i find that very intriguing and that's not something necessarily yeah. that someone told me to do it just sort of comes about in practice like yeah. you were saying i guess the next thing was breathing and I, my curiosity there was did vonda give specific instruction around breathing um, yes. So, um, and, um, and to your point earlier, I, I believe she, she, she learned about moving on the out breath, um, probably from dusk guitar. You're, pro you're probably absolutely right on that. Um, but, um, but I think she thought about it in, um, in, in, in a way that perhaps was a little different from, um, from, from his, um, uh, mental approach. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so, um, so in, in her, in Vonda's approach, the movements are made, whatever movements they happen to be, are made on the out breath, even, you know, picking up my cup of coffee on the out breath, waving at you on the out breath, everything on the out breath, all the movements on the out breath. So what that, and then somebody, and then somebody might think, well, what do we do on the in breath? So on yes. the in breath, <laughs> on the in breath, we, we, pa we generally pause and relax as much as possible. Pause and relax, breathe in. And then when you, when you're ready to make that movement, whatever it is, you do that on the out breath. And, um, and what I realized was what she was actually saying was move when not only, not your mind is most relaxed, but actually deep in your body is most relaxed. So move when the diaphragm, which is deep inside, is most relaxed. So the movements are relaxation. So therefore the postures are 
um, uh, a manifestation of release or relaxation. So then it's not a job to be done or something to be accomplished. It's a release. So, so the, the more, let's say, convoluted or challenging postures require more release, not hard, harder work. Um, Mm-hmm. And, um, and 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 this this was completely the opposite of uh, of my initial training, which said if you work harder, you'll get you'll get what you want. The harder you work, the more you'll get. Mm-hmm. And um, and she was she was the opposite. She was saying the opposite. The more you let go, the more will unfold. And the other piece um, is that. And, and this this comes directly from everybody's yoga, which is a balance between inaction and action, right? Or we might say passive and active. Um, so once a certain amount of unwinding has taken place, then you can act. But then you're acting with, um, I think you said, energy, not effort. You know, so the energy and, and you know, for most of us um, stressed out um Adults, um, there's a lot of unwinding that um, that we don't even know about, um, and and once that that unwinding sort of sets in and begin, you know, we we begin to be able to access. Sounds odd to say, but we begin to be able to access the unwinding. Once we once that occurs, then then the the postures or whatever else we want to do. Is um, becomes you know becomes easier. So these are oh, these are activities that um, that are accessible. The more we the more we let go. Yeah. I mean, I love that. I think that purports with my experience and a lot of other people I know where the emphasis yeah. went from alignment and accomplishment, like you were saying, like the accomplishment of these forms to what I think of is stirasuka, like what you were saying, the effort, the passive, you know, that feeling there's a process of unwinding or uh, undoing of patterns is sometimes the words that get used. Yeah. Uh, that has mm-hmm. to happen first in, in the cultivation of stirasuka. That seems like what you're describing, but that ultimately there's more sukha, there's more ease and balance to it. So it isn't this, over exertion and reaching and striving but you're using this word relaxation and the movement having that in it yeah. i guess my curiosity is i'm i'm not clear was vonda's classes did they were they more moving forms or were they more static poses or were they both were they a mix they were no they were poses they were poses definitely yeah. poses um, so when you say move on the exhale when was that happening um Within the posture, but I mean, she, she, um, hmm, how do I put this? Um, so we practiced, we practiced the posture, um, but then on the, on the out breath, I mean, there, I mean, there was movement, absolutely there was movement, but, um, I guess I thought you meant sort of free form movement. No, 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 that wasn't it. There was, there was movement within the structure of the posture. And, um, so the breathing was definitely a movement. The mm-hmm. grounding was visible or tangible, tangible, possibly visible and palpable. If someone had their hand on your body, you could feel that movement down. Um, you could um, see or feel or touch movement um, up as well through the spine or in, in two directions. So the, so the two directional, it's actually multi, multi-directional, but ju- let's just say two, the two directional movement was tangible in the body. In fact, that's that's what we that's what we're looking for. Visible, it's visible. You can see, and um, and also palpable. If you had your hand on someone, you'd feel it. But it wasn't it wasn't free for a movement. That's all I meant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's my curiosity. So we're talking about more subtle observation of movement of like the expansion and contraction of breath happening in you, not necessarily people like undulating their spines while they're in their down dogs or something like that. Or was that happening too? <laughs> You could you could see it for sure. You could see it, and um, and you could feel it. Um, but um, but this you know this this undulating piece 
um, can also be exaggerated, and and sometimes that's helpful. It's an well, interesting point, actually. Well, that's that's we've we've gotten to where I wanted to get about this okay. this third principle of a long right. lengthening. Sometimes people say lengthening the spine, and I have yeah. to say, like. I also, I think it might have been you who wrote this or Esther, someone wrote elongate the spine in wave-like pulsations. And to right. me, there's something different because, and I'll just fill you in, I have a bit of a younger baggage myself where, like many people, I was under the impression that creating axial extension in my spine and holding my body like that as much as I could more of the time was ideal. And I think that I created like a an ex- extension pattern in my upper thoracic that really caused problems. And I later had to really yeah. let go of these ideas of forever yeah. holding my spine straight in poses and allowing for curves more. And it was quite a process yeah. um, for me. And it was about an idea that I had about my body that changed yeah. it ultimately. But yeah. I guess when someone says lengthen their spine, I have this little PTSD thing that happens. But when someone says in wave-like pulsations, I've been talking about pulsing movement in my spine a lot these days because that's what I've observed. So I'm curious if you could speak to what Von de Men or what your understanding is about this Mm -hmm. idea of lengthening your spine and what it has to do with wave-like pulsations. Okay, so everything expands and contracts. That's the way every li- every living cell expands and contracts. Um, in fact, that's a that's a description of the of the universe, or the universe is expanding and contracting. The moon waxes and, and wanes. Uh, wanes exactly. Yeah, and um, and it sounds a little bit like a cliche these days, but when Vanda began to talk about the wave. Um, it, um, what, what, what she, what she meant was exactly that as far as I understood. Exactly that. So there's a, there's a pulling back and there's a rolling forward. So, so it's not that we do something and then hold. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.